Behind me is the treatment suite at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham, the treatment suite for mental health. There are various different ways in which mental health is addressed in the UK today. Uh, I myself ended up in an NHS mental health unit in 2006 and the interventions that were used with me were mainly medication based. Part of the project is to look at those approaches and to look at different approaches, for example holistic approaches that exist in our society to see or try to examine what works and what doesn't work and issues surrounding that. history of the asylums was actually to save people from what was happening in society to the, to the mentally ill back in the uh, 1800s and the idea of the, the early reformers was that we must have, have a good life, people must be, if they have good food, um, a healthy environment, there's work for them, then people will get better. There weren't other treatments at that time. But gradually the, things be it, the life became impoverished in, in mental hospitals because there wasn't an effective treatment, other treatments, and that was only good up to a point, that sort of the good life, that deteriorated, resources deteriorated, so you've got this business of large wards with 30 people on it, doing things in groups, um, not really having much of an individual life. We were about the first in the, in, in the Midlands to, uh, to close the hospital completely. And it was, it, was, it was pretty successful, I think, really, looking back, because we took care and, and developed appropriate supports in the community. More individualised accommodation, smaller housing. Uh, looking back, one wouldn't do it all in the same way. One did it in, but but, but when, you know, when, given what was known then, I think it was reasonably successful in doing it over a process of six or seven years I suppose really. People living in these wards say do you want to leave? They said no but that's a factor of institutionalisation. There was an emphasis on communal living so um, unlike other parts of the hospital where food was delivered um, uh, people were expected to prepare food and, and look after themselves um, so uh, there weren't domestics that came and cleaned. The idea was that the residents looked after the environment themselves. So if you like, it, it created a situation where people had to get on with their lives, albeit in a psychiatric hospital, and they had to get on with each other in order to be able to get on with their lives. Often people did find help. I mean, a lot of people who use those eye psychiatric units will talk about particular people they met um, and you know how they were rescued from difficult situations um, of in abusive situations that they were living in um, and it did create a moment for people to uh, to do something about their lives. Some of the problems around the psychiatric unit was 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 the way that people were mixed uh, and so that, that, you know, they often became places where incredibly different needs were being met in, in the same place. I mean, occasionally suicide would happen and so you, you can imagine that, that, that the psychiatric units in themselves could be uh, extremely traumatising. There's a whole range of questions about the efficacy of, of these, these drugs. And, uh, and I don't think there's any particularly strong evidence that the newer antipsychotic drugs are any more effective than the old ones. I mean, certainly you found that some people responded far better to particular drugs than others. So it's not just a, a blanket question of this drug is better than that one, it's this drug maybe was more helpful for this person than, than that one. I mean historically there's, there's been problems around com what they call compliance, about people continuing to take the drugs and that was partly resolved with the use of what were called depot injections, long-acting injections. The idea behind 
um, these these drugs was was that that you wanted people to take them on a long term basis. So they, they weren't short term fixes for acute psychiatric problems. They were long term fixes for what were perceived to be more or less lifelong uh, illnesses. To some degree, you have to be pragmatic about these things, and that uh, for some people medication makes a difference. The developments haven't always been, often haven't been as successful as we'd hoped for. Some of the side effects of the old medications aren't with the new medications, but the new medications have other, have other side effects. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the goal is always to try the effective, to find the effective medication which doesn't have the, the, the side effects, but there is a need for it, but I think the emphasis on it is very extreme. So the, I'm a firm believer in terms of my ethics and the way I practice in the psychosocial model. Um, and that to me means taking the whole view of the person. You know, the medical model, it set, up, set people up to fail in some ways in that in order to get help, you need a diagnosis. By and large, I'm against the idea as a first line of intervention that you look to psychiatric drugs as a solution. Uh, and I think one of the problems, particularly in, in the way that services are currently organised, is that often if somebody walks in to see their family doctor and they can't sleep, or they feel stressed, um, or they feel low, is, that, is that, that the easiest first line of intervention is just to write, write a prescription. Um, I mean, a lot of work has been done about trying to introduce psychological therapies into primary care, so, so that that isn't, if you like, regarded as the uh, first um, first uh, solution that people are presented with. Sometimes I think they can be more ineffective than effective um, and even when someone says to me, you know, I'm autistic, I'll go, okay, tell me about that. Tell me what you experience. There are various symptoms of autism. Um, not everyone experiences it in the same way. And even within the label, there is an individual within that. There are a lot of people who don't suffer from um, uh, these severe illnesses. Uh, we all of us have suffered episodes of depression. We all suffer episodes. It's part of life. Uh, we're all from time to time live in terrible circumstances, or some people live in terrible circumstances, you know, and it, and it affects them psychologically. And then I think it's in, 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 in that area of issues that you say, well, how appropriate is, is medication then? How, you know, go through a period of not sleeping. Well, hang on, okay, maybe you take something for a few nights, but hang on, the prescription's there for month after month. It's, it's too easy. It's too easy for the doctor, too easy for the person themselves who doesn't want to think of anything, anything else. When I first went on it, um, that was quite horrendous as well because I was put on Tyroxtex for a while, which now they've taken off the shelves because it did actually lead to people committing suicide and I was quite bad on that and I was taken off it quite quickly afterwards. I became worse on it and they took me off. Uh, and now I'm on Promising, uh, sorry, not Promising and uh, Venaflexin. And once to help me relax at night because I overthink, I'm thinking all the time. Um, and calms me down at the end of the night so I can get some sleep. Um, and a promising just tops up my levels of serotonin. Um, I wish I didn't have to take tablets because I'm not, I'm not a big believer in tablets. Um, but I know that it's helped me get to where I am now, although I didn't believe it in the first. Because um, I found um, a lot of the medication in the mental health service is trial and error. Um, they try you on something to see how it goes and they'll keep you on it as long as it, you don't falter from the, the level line they got you at. In the illness, if you can communicate um, 
on the same level basis. They listen to you as a person and, un and understand and a sympathetic ear. That it will work better in the medication because I believe the, the biggest improvement in mental health for a decade, I believe, is talking therapies and we've seen a big increase in the, the recovery rate on that. We did, especially around depression and that, um, talking things through with people. Taking the person holistically um, and dealing with not just, you know, and taking therapy in the widest sense. So, um, and what I mean by that is not just practical needs, but also, you know, self-esteem and building the person up, getting them to realise the potential within themselves. So I think the social model is about, again, that common sense view, that realistic view of what's out there in the world, what's out in the community, and knowing about that culture, that context of the person, um, and then using that knowledge to understand their world. It was actually from my own community I was able to obtain talking therapies to the an organisation called HARP in Birmingham. Um, they done some talking therapies for the, um, not only the Irish community, but they were based at the beginning mainly around the Irish. And uh, we paid like a, uh, so, so much to go and see them. I think I was paying about a five for a visit um, then. And that was one of the steps towards mum recovery. Because um, it was finding out why I, I was where I am now, and once I knew that, I knew I was, and what had happened, and because you lose your identity, you don't know who you are. You're blank, and you say to yourself some morning to get up, and you don't recognise yourself in the window, the mirror. Sorry, or you know, or if you're passing a shop and you see a glance, and you say, "Who's that guy? Who's that person?" Um, it's that bad sometimes. We've done a lot of work around people who hear voices. Um, and, you know, we're very much against the idea that you should assume if somebody hears voices that underlying that is some kind of psychiatric condition. For, for many people, making sense of the circumstances and the experiences that lie behind the voices means that they're better able to live with and manage those experiences. But, but just to say that, but that there are also people who experience extremely distressing voices for whom medication is an attractive solution and they find relief from the use of medication so you know I don't I wouldn't want to be dogmatic about saying you know medication doesn't have a value for people who have those types of difficulties. Life's been ruptured but there is definite possibility for repair and that is due to and I think family plays a big part in that family friends people that you see around you suffering with this whatever that is they're suffering with whether it be mental health or not you notice a change in personality in that person change in the way that they conduct themselves or however they normally are call call upon it just make it explicit talk about it by and large the idea that that psychological therapies um, are used as an adjunct to medication so that you use both of them uh, as a way to help people. I, I, that idea seems to have more or less taken, taken hold. Um, so my, my, my preference is that, that, that you know, um, medication isn't necessarily the most helpful or at least the most helpful first step in helping people with their difficulties. And as far as, as far as I'm concerned, that counts for people who present with what might be a psychotic illness. It's about prevention, absolutely. It is huge. I, you know, I'm a firm believer, the earlier the better. And, and you know, right, this is why I work with, worked a lot of my experiences with children and adolescents. It's working with their resilience because they bounce back 
and then it doesn't need to manifest for years and we get years later we get hear about trauma or abuse and things going on later in life but people don't recognize when they were younger and that's and i'm very much for early intervention leads to prevention what we should do is treat mental illness as a normal kind of illness um, or whether you ask a, I suppose, a, a slightly more profound question, which is, you know, maybe this isn't an illness, maybe this is the human condition. Uh, and, and, you know, try and get society to not regard people who are different as the same, but to maybe rethink about, you know, what, what normal human life is, is about.